I'm Scott Allen Miller, and today I'm going to be doing a little talk about why cryptocurrency isn't of interest to anyone in Nicaragua. This is important because it comes up on the channel a lot, and someone was saying today they had some great ideas of how to get crypto into the country, and I totally appreciate why it seems like people here might want crypto to just ease transactions and maybe make it uh, faster and more fluid to do sales around the country, maybe avoid some government oversight and such, uh, but there's some important points that people need to understand and this comes up quite a lot that people are talking about crypto mostly because people who are in the crypto world tend to be really passionate about it which is a very dangerous thing because it is a currency and currencies are a part of finance and business and we really need to take emotion out of the emotion is how people get burned and so i want to talk about some of these things um, because some well-meaning people with some really solid ideas maybe missing some important points. And I just, I, I couldn't do this in a short video, so I'm doing a special uh, to get this out for you. So so if you're looking for my dailies, you're looking for the regular stuff, this isn't it. This is me doing an extra uh, deep dive into why crypto won't really work here. And the idea, let's start with what the idea was. So if you watch my recent episode on crypto in Nicaragua and El Salvador doing a comparison, El Salvador is all in on Bitcoin. And, and it doesn't matter which one we're talking about, that's just the one that the country has gone with. Nicaragua could totally use something else and they can make their own as well. Those, those options exist. So uh, the idea came up because there, there just isn't crypto in Nicaragua. And, the, and so there's no banks, there's no way to make it useful. You can't go have Bitcoin or anything else and go do something with it in Nicaragua. It just doesn't work. You would then have to go back to the United States, do another transaction and then bring the money back into Nicaragua. Like it's horribly complicated. Um, it does work for Nicaraguans who want to do transactions in the United States they could use crypto in the US to do all their transactions. That part's fine. It's just their Nicaragua transactions don't make any sense on Bitcoin or anything like that. So the proposed idea, because there is no bank, is, well, in small communities, just pick any, it could be like in a little neighborhood in Managua or it could be a little village somewhere, whatever, that you get one or two people together. Now, this would have to be expats or Nicaraguans with American bank accounts, right? Because you, you have to have access to the U.S. or some other easy exchange market with U.S. dollars to be able to do this. Um, so there are other markets, and El Salvador is one of them, but you would have to have this transaction ability in that country because if normal people had it, then this whole thing would be moot, right? This is all because people don't have the ability to move money in and out of a country with a Bitcoin exchange or a crypto exchange of some sort. So the first thing is you got to find someone in every community who has access access to that. So I could do it, for example, right? So I have a bank account in the United States. I'm totally allowed to and easily can go use a Coinbase, for example, and I can go or, or um, Binance, right? And I can go and I can make transactions and get money, or I could use a traditional bank, give them Bitcoin, they'll give me US dollars. Great, now I have US dollars. I'm allowed to bring in about, a little bit less, than $10,000 a month into Nicaragua without it causing an alert. Let's just be clear. This is the point at which you have to report it. That doesn't make every transaction that is under $10,000 legal, and it does not imply that transactions over $10,000 are not allowed. It's just that over $10,000, you have to report it, and then they will definitely know what you're doing. So the assumption that we're trying to do this below $10,000 or in small amounts is the assumption that it is illegal, which it probably is, um, now, if you're doing this for a friend, right? So you've got a buddy and they're like, look, man, I just did a job for someone. Like I painted his house. We'll assume your buddy's Nicaraguan, right? That's why they have this problem. I painted this guy's house. He didn't have money, but he gave me, you know, 0 0.0001 Bitcoins. That's worth about 500 bucks. What can I do? If you said, hey, man, give me the Bitcoins. I'll go cash it out in the U.S. I'll get the money back and then I'll pay you uh, the $500 in U.S. Or maybe I'll transfer it into Cordoba and pay you the equivalent in Cordoba, which is about 30. Uh, um, I'll try not to do the math off the top of my head. Sounds like 17,500 Cordoba, something like that. Um, I'll do that for you right now. You would not get in trouble for that. Even if the government was standing there watching over your shoulder going, what you doing? What you doing? They'd be like, yeah, that's cool. Thanks for helping them out. Right. Not a problem. But if you want to start running like a little business where you're actually acting as a bank, I guarantee, I don't know what laws these are, but I guarantee beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is not a gray area, you will be absolutely afoul of many different laws. Money laundering being one of them. Money laundering is just that you have to report things above $10,000 in order to announce that you're not money laundering and make sure they're looking over your shoulder. You can still you can break the law and actually launder money below ten thousand dollars. It's not that moving two thousand dollars illegally isn't still money laundering. It's just that you don't have to report it. 
you're just not allowed to do it, right? So it's it's kind of it's kind of a funny thing, but it's it's if you're doing a legal transaction above ten thousand dollars, you have to report it so that someone can verify that you're legal. So that if you believe you're legal, they can say yes, yes, that's cool. Okay, go ahead. If you're at below ten thousand dollars, you are self monitoring. You have to ensure that you're not breaking the law. And I guarantee that if you're doing this, you're breaking the law. So it doesn't matter that you're under $10,000, you're still not allowed to do it. It's just that the banks aren't necessarily going to catch you. If you do a $10,000 transaction or a group of transactions that become 10,000 very quickly, that is going to flag them. They're gonna say, well, we have to report this. And now you're gonna get monitored and instantly you're gonna be shut down. This just makes it a little bit harder to get caught, but we have to be clear, the whole premise is not getting caught that's fundamentally problematic and will lead to a lot of the things in the discussion. And that's why it doesn't exist now, right? Because it's not allowed. If it was allowed, yeah, someone would do it. Like there would, you know, it would be easy and, and it would already be done. So the idea here is that someone in the neighborhood who must be either a Nicaraguan with a US bank account, which does exist, like that's not unheard of, or one of many expats who have access to US bank accounts. Keep in mind, now if a Nicaraguan does it, the amount of trouble they can get in is probably pretty small as long as they're, you know, attempting to do things more or less upright, you know, right? Uh, like, oh yeah, he gave me a hundred bucks of this, I gave him a hundred bucks of that, that's all I'm doing, right? Mm, okay, the government may make you stop, but they're probably not gonna be super upset. They're gonna be like, what were you thinking? Stop that. But if an expat does that, I can pretty much guarantee if you get caught, which is almost guaranteed that you will, you're going to either lose your residency or lose your, your tourist status, and you're not going to be welcome back. Running illegal banks is the kind of thing that it doesn't get you thrown in jail, probably, but it probably gets you an escort to the border and have a nice day. This isn't the country for you. So this is considered a relatively risky activity. Imagine doing this in the United States or Canada. Oh, your neighborhood uh, didn't have a type of bank because the government didn't want them to, and you decided to run a underground black market bank behind the government's back to do something they decided they weren't interested in, not that they're opposed to, and not that Bitcoin's illegal, just this is not a type of banking that they've approved. Well, I'm gonna go do this banking anyway. That is definitely how you get in a lot of trouble. In the US, you would definitely go to jail uh, unless you were uh, a resident, then you would absolutely be deported, no question. So, you know, just, you're gonna be treated like this anywhere in the world. Black market banking is a risky activity, a very risky activity. So just, Keep that in mind. Now, let's talk about some, let's just assume you're not gonna get caught. In real world, assume you would get caught, just a matter of time. If you start doing this, you've started a clock ticking on your deportation, that's, that's reality. But ignoring that, so the maximum you could reasonably do within a month is about $10,000 of total transactions. If you live in Nicaragua, you're a real resident, and you're bringing in, say, $50,000 a month of income, you certainly can do that. And the government's gonna do anything but complain, right? They will make you show where the money's come from, but they're gonna go, excellent, that's coming from your job? Good job, man. Thanks for living in Nicaragua. That's gonna be the conversation. But if it's coming in from a bunch of Nicaraguans giving you money, they're gonna be like, whoa, 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 why are you running a business in Nicaragua without a license, right? So it's a completely different thing. So you can't go above $10,000 because you have to hide that in your total transactions because now you're making it your personal income, which for most people isn't $10,000, uh, and the income or the appearance of income from the bank, the money transferring in the bank, all has to stay below that $10,000 number as far as the transfers are concerned. So you've got to transfer out something in Bitcoins, which won't be monitored because it's in cryptocurrency, and then transfer in something in US dollars because you won't be able to get Cordoba in any amount outside the country, so you'll have to bring in US dollars, but that's fine because we use US dollars here. Um, and so you'll, you'll bring that in. But so let's say you have a monthly living, like your income, your personal income, if you weren't doing any of this, is let's just pick a, a really handy number, $5,000. You're living on $5,000, which is great. You'd be doing really well here. You could live pretty much anywhere, do almost anything. Okay, so you've got 5,000. That means you have 5,000 left to work with for doing these transactions. So the maximum of banking activity that you could do for your neighborhood or whatever is $5,000 per month. So that's a pretty small number. It's a really small number to be taking on a lot of risks for. But there's a lot of not just risks, but actual costs with this. So first of all, there's always the chance that you get scammed or make a mistake. So that's a business risk that always, when you're doing a financial transaction, you gotta have a lot of overhead to cover potential mistakes. Because one little mistake, you could lose 
$100,000, right? Oh, I accidentally gave someone the wrong, you know, I put the decimal place in the wrong spot on a Bitcoin transaction, and instead of $1,000, I gave him $10,000. Oh no, right? Hey man, can you give that back? It was a mistake. Why would he give it back? Right? He's under no legal obligation to give you back that money because it's your mistake. And if you go to the government, what are you going to do? I was running an illegal bank and I breached money laundering rules and limits. And I'd like to report that I made a mistake. It's not theft, but would he please give it back? That's going to be a really rough conversation. You basically don't have even the protections you would normally have, which still you need a lot of overhead to cover. So it's a really risky activity. But there's overhead too. So when they do the transaction from Bitcoin to dollars, there's one, it's gonna take your time. Where's that time going to come from, right? To do 5,000, so imagine it's a whole bunch of people doing five or $50 transactions. Well, you've gotta stop and manage those transactions. Are you gonna hire staff in Nicaragua? That seems weird, and who's gonna pay for that? Uh, are you gonna do it yourself? That's even weirder because, as, you know, if you're making enough money and have the resources to do this, you make way too much money for this system. The time that you're gonna put into this business is gonna cost you a lot. If you were to do some other activity that's more fun and less stressful and less risky, like just doing some online work, you could be making hundreds or thousands of dollars per month on the same amount of effort or less than doing this. So essentially you would have to donate a significant amount of money via your time in doing this instead of another job or some other business activity. Uh, so it's going to be a massive cost in overhead, whether you're just looking to absorb it as a donation or you need to make it up somehow from these transactions. But easily the amount of transactions could have overhead between 50 and 100 percent you would need to bring in 2500 to 5000 dollars per month to cover your costs um and and some small amount of the risks from doing these transactions that's uh, a lot and that doesn't cover your deportation risk that's just the overhead because you have to do the transaction to get the money into the u.s you then have to do the cash out in the u.s you then have to transfer the money from the u.s back to nicaragua and then potentially you have to transfer it from u.s dollars into cordoba each one of those transactions takes time and you have to pay some other entity for their time to do the transaction so you're paying a exchange you're paying u.s banks you're paying for the international transfer you're paying for the everything right? The, the local transfer into Cordoba. So the overhead becomes very high and it makes using crypto in a place like Nicaragua extremely expensive. It doesn't lower your overhead. It carries more overhead than a normal bank transaction. And let's be uh, real clear on how this works. If I want to pay someone else in Nicaragua, so my friend, I bought some stuff from her recently, some jewelry uh, for my wife for Christmas. And if I was to pay her in crypto, uh, she would have no way to cash it out. So I would need to go to the US, somehow put my money in the US into crypto. There's a transaction that is not hard and I can do easily. But it's a transaction I have to make uh, that locally I don't have to make. So that's important. Um, so there's an extra step for me. I then now have this crypto. I then have to pay, get, you know, work out with her, but let's assume that she wants to take crypto. I then pay her in the crypto wherever, right? That happens anywhere. It's, it's outside jurisdiction. So, okay, so that happens. No problem. Now she has that crypto. How is she going to cash it out? Well, she's got to find someone that she can give that crypto to who has a bank in the U.S. She does not, so she has to give it to someone. That person is then going to uh, go through all the steps we said, maybe take some time. They're going to need to aggregate some, some transactions, so she's going to have to wait for them to aggregate. Then they're going to have to uh, bring the money into Nicaragua. That takes at least a day, and then once they have it, they have to pay her. And how? what are they going to do? Are they going to take the cash out at the ATM? They're going to generally pay, unless you're in one of the very, very few places that have the free ATMs. They're extremely few and far between. They're probably going to pay a foreign transaction fee on their bank. Maybe not, and they're probably going to have to pay an ATM fee. Maybe not, and the ATM fees vary between about 0.5%, I believe, is the lowest, up to about 4% as the highest. But most of us, under most banking situations, if you know how to use an ATM at all, pay around 1%. So it's not tragic by any stretch, but 1% of transaction lost over time. So if you're doing $5,000 a month in transactions for people, that one piece, just turning things into cash, is going to cost you $50 a month if you're taking it out at the ATM, on average, if you're able to maximize and, and use it efficiently. That's not so great. So there's all these, these steps, plus the overhead of moving from Cordoba into dollars. That's going to be really low, but you might lose 
0.1%. Maybe a little bit less, but it will be a loss somewhere. So, and there's all the rounding errors and stuff, right? Because you're dealing with three different currencies to do this transaction. Like, think about that. You have to go from US into Bitcoin, Bitcoin, or whatever currency, Bitcoin into US, US into Cordoba. That's a lot of moving money back and forth between different exchanges and a lot of opportunity for rounding problems. So somewhere those just just overhead. Now you get that cash, you have to hand that cash to them. How are you going to get that cash to them? Well, now you're into the normal Nicaraguan system. However, as the person who's standing there has done all this transaction and is now holding Cordoba, you're now in the same position that I was starting off. In both cases, we're here in Nicaragua holding Cordoba and want to give that money to that other person. So after all those transactions, we're now at the starting point for each person. We've gained nothing. This entire transaction shifted the money from me to this other person. That's it. It didn't solve anything. In both cases, we now have to hand Cordoba to my friend who's going to do the work. Well, I could hand it to her in person when I see her, but yeah, maybe the other person is physically closer. But what difference does that make? Bank accounts are free and transactions in bank accounts are free. So even if you live in the same town, you're not going to hand cash to them. You're just going to stop by the corner, hand cash to them and ask them to pop it into the bank account of the person you're going to pay, especially if there's a business because you want a receipt. For me, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to go to the corner, hand them cash or do it online. I can do it on my phone, put money directly into their account from my account. So if I have an account here, if I have a bank account, BAC, Lafise, uh, Banpro, whatever, I can just say, oh, I have this money. I would like them to have this money. There's no overhead whatsoever, and it's instant. They will call me two seconds later, say, hey, I got the money. Cool, thanks. Right, that's it. No overhead, no cost, no legal problems whatsoever. Everything is perfectly fluid. All of these extra steps exist only to get that other person into a position where they're going to do that transaction for me. That saved nothing but took on a lot of risk and a lot of money. So you can see why doing a person-to-person -person transaction in a system where we already have a completely free instant digital payment system doesn't make any sense. It actually introduces the very problems that it kind of proposes it's going to fix. It, you want to lower the overhead? No, it raises the overhead. You want to speed it up? No, it slows it down. You want to make it less risky? No, it makes it more risky. You want to make it more secret? No, it makes it less secret. Now, as a business, if you're doing business-to-business -business transactions, we have the same problems, but we also need receipts, and this is huge. You pay taxes on all the money you don't lose while doing business. So it's really important for a business in Nicaragua, because we have to pay taxes, to show the things that we're buying. So let's say I'm buying some, I don't know, new handmade placemats for a business. Well, when I make that transaction, I don't want to pay in Bitcoin because it'll be more difficult to show the transaction in a reasonable way. I could do it, but it's more work. When I use digital to digital transfer through the existing banking system and get a printed receipt, it's very easy. I just attach that to my paperwork and I'm done. It's all set. So that's the easiest way to do it. And as a business, you always want to show those transactions. Hiding it just means you're getting taxed for no reason. Why would you want to do that? You don't. So that doesn't count for business either. Now, if we were going to do all these transactions in cash rather than digital, well, they don't have a bank account. I don't have a bank account. Okay. This is where, you know, they can potentially hand cash to the person instead of me handing cash to the person. Maybe they're far away. So that makes it seem like, oh, maybe that's a place where it would make sense. But no, if we were going to do that, I'm still not sending money to that person. I could say, so this is, I'm person A, I'm trying to pay my friend. And then person B, with the Bitcoin transaction that we described, going through the US, going through all these steps, what I'm doing is eventually getting that money to person B, and then they have cash and they can hand it to my friend. Well, if that's what we wanted to do, if that's the problem we're trying to solve, I would just go to the local store. I have cash, so I have to go to the store. I can't use my app. Put the cash in there and give it to that person with a note, because they give notes on the transactions. It says, this is for paying my friend. And then they will have the cash instantly, zero overhead, no cost whatsoever, and they can hand the cash to my friend. So in both cases, whether I'm dealing with cash, whether they're dealing with cash, whether I have a bank account or they have a bank account, any combination of that matrix, it is faster, cheaper, safer, and more efficient to do it without the cryptocurrency. There's no spot where the cryptocurrency doesn't hurt the transaction. So when we're looking at this, uh, this falls into a category, and I know why it's tempting, and it's extremely tempting. I've done whole videos on this, that when we come from North America and we come to places like Nicaragua, we've been trained that the U.S. knows better, that things we do are more advanced. And when you get here and spend time, you pretty quickly go, 
Oh, no, that's not true. So much stuff is more advanced here. Not everything, but a lot, right? Telephone systems more advanced, internet more advanced, roads quite a bit better. A lot of different systems are better here. Other ones are terrible, right? Some of the, some of the, things that we have going on are so backwards and so old like yeah it's not perfect it's not everything better but a lot of things are payment systems like this is actually a spot where there's a bit of an edge here like it's so easy to completely free pay each other that the idea that we would use crypto to solve a problem doesn't make any sense we don't have a problem to solve in that area that isn't to say that crypto in the long term couldn't be an important thing but the place where it would be useful is in the same place as el salvador the reason that el salvador did it is because of remittance they want to get remittance at low overhead from outside the country and if you have a central bank that is willing to participate in the system and it approves other banks to work in the system and you have full government support of it, then using it as a low friction way to do remittance and bypassing the Western unions and remittances of the world could be a way to get more money faster into the country without losing so much on the overhead. So that completely has value. But you have to remember that El Salvador did it because they were officially on the US dollar and they wanted to get some freedom from the United States. They needed to break away from them to some degree and their way of doing so was coming up with another currency, but they didn't have a central bank or their own currency. So they didn't have the freedom to do something without either creating that massive mechanism, which is extremely expensive and takes a really long time, or implementing something that already existed, like Bitcoin. In Nicaragua, we do have our own currency, the Cordoba, and we have our own central bank, just called the central bank. So because of that, we have a strong desire as a country not to have cryptocurrency used here because it would undermine the financial controls and stability caused by those mechanisms that we've invested so heavily in. El Salvador didn't invest in those things and had to then work around it when they decided that that was a gap in their financial infrastructure. Nicaragua does not have that gap, and so we don't need to solve that problem we solved it long ago. And it worked just during the during the pandemic when the United States went through a, a higher than usual inflation and Nicaragua didn't want to go through similar inflation. They used their central bank and they used their own currency here to lower inflation by deflating the local in respect to the US dollar. That was a really important mechanism. And other times when the US does not inflate enough, they artificially inflate the Cordoba to make sure that we keep a steady, healthy level of inflation. Because inflation is a good thing, just at a predictable small level. Once it's hyperinflation, of course it's bad. Deflation is a disaster. So having some mechanisms to protect against that is really important. El Salvador does not. El Salvador can inflate or deflate beyond their control at any given moment, and that has a lot of risks. It's not necessarily all bad, but it is very risky. And that's something they've taken on because they kind of have to. They were backed into a corner. We're not. We're a little bit larger uh, country. We've just had this a little bit extra separation from the US for longer. So we have that benefit. And this is a place where it plays out. So overall, imagining that you're going to find a single person who is willing to take on all of this cost and risk to build a private secret black market exchange, and then imagining that there's any person in the country who's going to be like, you know what, I want to use this service is going to be really tough. Now, the place where they might want to use this service is that they are going to uh, have money coming in from the outside. So US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, you name it, some places sending money to these people in Nicaragua, they don't have a way to do a normal transfer, so they want to do it through Bitcoin so they can bypass the Western unions and things like that. Okay, great. You could do that for them. However, this brings in an additional problem. Other than lowering the overhead by a tiny bit, it's a very small amount of lowering the overhead, what would the reason be that you wanted to do this? And I think you'll instantly, as I'm saying it, realize what the problem is here. If you are operating as an unregistered bank and you do transfers in with money, any amount of money, and the person to whom you're giving that money or the person from whom you're receiving that money turn out to be committing any kind of crime, you would be 100% liable as an accomplice in that crime because you are not a bank. You don't have banking protections. You don't have a set of protocols that you can follow and say, look, I followed the rules and they did something with the money. That's not my problem. This would be, I am not a bank. I just took their word that they were not criminals and I helped them do something that may have gotten caught by a normal bank or at least would have been, the bank would have been indemnified. And so very quickly, the primary potential users of your system would be people looking to do things that could be extremely illegal. We're talking about people doing drug trades, arm trades, all kinds of things, like really extreme 
criminal activity. No one's going to do this for, oh yeah, I bought some, uh, I bought some illicit uh, pottery that I didn't want to pay taxes on. So if I could move $200 around without anyone knowing, like that'd be cool, man. That is not what's going to happen. Those people are just going to pay the $3 of taxes. No, what they're going to be doing is people who are going to be like, oh, I'm going to do this really complicated thing that normal people don't understand for doing this thing that makes absolutely no sense for legitimate reasons. Ah, yeah, you can imagine. That's going to be mostly criminal. So even if you found someone who was willing to take on the general risks and willing to just donate tons of money to do this, <coughs> you're never going to find legitimate people in the country who want to use this system. There's just no value to it. There's no value for interchange inside the country, and there's very little uh, reasonable reason that you would want to use it from outside the country, outside of really minor benefits that, yes, while they exist, are so risky that I can't imagine anyone getting away with it for any amount of time, nor anyone wanting to. So I don't think this system uh, is going to work. But overall, the idea that we have this thing from North America, that kind of makes sense. But remember, it's not being used heavily in North America at all, right? The number of times that I've had anyone attempt, I run businesses all over. Do you know how many people accept or want to pay in Bitcoin? It's like zero, right? I'm not saying that no one does it, but it's like little niche communities, even in the US. It is of all my friends, like I know no one who even knows how to do it, let alone actually does do it or wants to do it. And if you're coming to a place like Nicaragua, most people haven't even heard of it. El Salvador, where they've made a huge government push, they put ATMs everywhere. They, they like market it as a way to be, you know, uh, patriotic. They've done it for years. And the results are, yeah, it's basically failed. Now they're pushing harder and they're, they're gonna, you know, they're, they're slowly trying to get it somewhere. But even with all their push, the results are people are not interested. It doesn't solve problems that they had, except for potentially the remittance. That is a special thing. But for them, they needed it in, for remittance in a way that Nicaragua doesn't. And they needed it to separate from the central bank. So, yeah, I know. Everyone, this, this falls under two things. One, trying to use crypto where it doesn't make sense. Everyone thinks crypto, everyone who's interested in crypto, right? You get passionate about it. And it's like, this is going to solve all these problems. But generally, if you actually look at, like normal financial uh, transactions and stuff, those aren't generally problems that most of us have. Normal people don't have need for crypto transactions. Some international businesses, some people doing really complex things, yes, and I run a business that does have reason to use crypto, but not in Nicaragua, right? In other countries because we're solving complex remittance problems, even in the places where it seems like and there's the most support, it's not functioning as a functional currency by and large. And then to come here where we don't have those needs, we don't have that push, we don't have the background, people just aren't interested, and, and think we're going to solve a problem. You have to, with, as with everything, one, you have to have an identified problem to solve, and then you have to determine if your solution will solve it. In this case, it does neither. There's no problem, and it doesn't solve anything. It makes everything worse. But I get why it seems like it must solve something, but we're projecting problems from somewhere else. And the other thing is, when you come to Nicaragua, and I have a whole video on this, everyone from outside feels like we're bringing all this knowledge and stuff from somewhere else. We're going to show Nicaraguans how to do things better. We're going to teach them. We're going to be this the savior, right? That's always going to fail. It is going to make you unhappy. It is going to make Nicaraguans unhappy because it is just, it's a terrible way to approach a new country in general. And I know why it happens and we all feel this way, but because marketing tells us we should, but we should not. They know their market. If they had problems, they would have already solved it or they would be coming to you asking for solutions. You wouldn't have to be projecting problems and going, hey, I imagine this problem you must be having. Let me solve it for you. No, they'd be coming to you and go, look, I have this problem. You're a foreigner. You could solve it. Here's the thing. And if that was true, it would have been solved long ago. Right? There's, there's no barrier to this. If this was actually a thing, the government would have solved it. They would let someone solve it. Someone would just entrepreneurial have solved it years ago. But it's not a problem. We're not, you know, that's just not the issue, right? The issue is, you know, lack of jobs in the economy, um, not having free access to regional countries for, for business, right? We can't sell goods into the U.S. very easily. And that's the majority of the local market, right? Things like that. Not having deep water ports on the Atlantic. Those are problems that we need to solve to really boost the economy. You can't do that through individuals who are just going to, you know, bring some idea from North America or from Europe. It, it's... I know why it's tempting, and I know that this is coming from an honest place where you want to do something good and you're imagining you're going to help a community, but trust me, that ent entire approach, the only thing that's going to <clears throat> really help communities is coming in and, and bringing income from, from foreign 
right? And spending it in the country, that does a ton, right? That's just open market growth. Uh, or if you want to go even farther than that, then starting companies here that sell services to the outside. Services or goods, whatever, right? You want to make bricks here and you're going to sell them to Canada? Perfect, right? That creates jobs here. Money comes from the outside into the country. That's how you create value. Doing things that consume services inside the country, that doesn't really create value, right? You got to be bringing people in from the outside. You got to be bringing in goods or services. Money has to flow in while goods and services flow out. That's how you fundamentally help the economy. And those, you got to identify, is that what you're doing? And if not, then it's probably not beneficial. You may shuffle money around inside the country. You may say, well, I'm making this, this community better, but it's coming at the expense of some other because you're, you know, you're, you're just shuffling the jobs around, right? I'm going to open up a new restaurant that only services Nicaraguans. I'm going to get rich from this. Well, every penny you are making in that scenario is being pulled out of the economy. So you're, you're running at a negative for the country. And uh, any amount of money that your employees are getting paid, while great, is coming at the expense of the employees at a different restaurant. So there has to be, you know, if your your restaurant's bringing in ten thousand dollars a year, that came at the expense of another restaurant losing ten thousand dollars a year. Um, and there's nothing wrong with being a better restaurant and, and eating someone's uh, lunch in a business sense, but it it doesn't help anybody. Now, if you're running a business that attracts foreigners to come to the country and spend more money than they would have spent before, that's different. So that's where you can actually be a benefit. Now, if you, it's complex, but you got to be you got to be creating that value. Think about where are you making value for the overall economy? And if you're not, then, then right, probably stop and rethink what is your value as a foreigner being in the country? It's just going to be spending your money. Those are the things. Those are the things that Nicaraguans can't do. They can't just get money from, from afar, and they can't necessarily uh, have access to sell goods or services into some other market. They just don't have the connections. They don't have the legal uh, position. Maybe they don't have the right to travel there to deal with things. Maybe they can't open a bank account, things like that. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. This is just an extra explanation of, of why crypto really, you just can't solve this um, and we shouldn't be trying to, there's no reason to be trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. There's no reason for foreigners to be trying to push a new currency into the country. We're not benefiting anyone. Um, it's fine to, to, you know, play the mental game and say, how could Bitcoin be beneficial here? How could USDC be beneficial here? Great, play those games. But if you don't know the local market inside and out, then you don't really have the mental position to be able to judge if those ideas are going to work. And there's a lot of things I don't even know. Right. I've been here for a long time and I know that all the things that we propose for Bitcoin are solved, solved so well that it would never, ever make sense at Bitcoin. Are there other things that are solved too? Yeah, easily. I just don't know what they are, but there's so many solutions here. It's like, you know, someone was looking the other day for a shuttle from, from here, from Leon to Managua. So they're asking around with all the expats and found something that worked pretty well, but took four hours and cost a bit of money. And I said, why don't you just take the local bus? Because it's $2, it takes half the time, because right, right, right from where you are to right where you want to go. They had no idea, right? And so that, that kind of stuff is like, oh, I'll, you know, people who live here, they've solved problems. They're not sitting around not solving their problems. They've solved them. And so very rarely is there something that we need to solve in the first place. And if someone's going to solve it as a foreigner, we're generally the last people able to, because we don't clearly understand the problems as well as locals. We don't understand which solutions have been tried, which ones make sense, which ones have problems of their own, and so forth. So thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. I will see all of you in our next episode.